five years since the Paris Climate Agreement, our planet is warming faster than ever. But around the world, people are taking action. So could the pandemic be a new chance to tackle the climate crisis? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Amanda Burrell, and welcome to a special edition of Inside Story in collaboration with the United Nations Environment Programme. The Paris Climate Agreement was born five years ago. World leaders pledged to cut carbon emissions and stop global temperatures rising by at least two and ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. But instead of changing course, the last five years have been the warmest on record. Wildfires, heat waves, floods and melting ice caps all point to our planet in crisis. And with natural habitats destroyed, disease outbreaks such as coronavirus pandemic could become more common. But despite the gloom, there is hope. Every year, the UN recognises people who lead by example in turning the planet around. The champions of the Earth this year include the Prime Minister of Fiji, the first country to ratify the Paris Agreement, an indigenous activist who pushed against drilling in the Ecuadorian Amazon, a farmer who modified traditional techniques to stop desertification in the Sahel, and a man who spent his life fighting environmental injustice in the United States. With the USA expected to be back in the climate fold and China committing to long-term emissions reduction targets, we are hopeful that the global momentum for reduction in greenhouse gas emissions can be reinvigorated and made even more ambitious. Anything else would be meaningless. Sabemos por qué está ocurriendo ese cambio climático. Sabemos por qué estamos dañando, estamos destruyendo nuestro planeta. Por eso es nuestro principio es seguimos respetando la selva. Before COVID-19, communities of color were inundated with all kinds of environmental hazards and disparities. COVID-19 brought to the surface the underbelly of what systemic racism is doing. We have two pandemics that's happening at the same time, the COVID pandemic and the pandemic of racism, and they both must be attacked at the same time. Let's bring in our guests. In Copenhagen, Inga Anderson. She's the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. And we have two recipients of the UN's Champions of the Earth Award. In Berlin is Dr. Fabian Leendertz. He's a zoonotic disease specialist and group leader at the Robert Koch Institute. In Boston is Mindy Luber, an environmental entrepreneur and CEO of Ceres, a non-profit sustainability advocacy organization. A warm welcome to you all, and thank you for being here. Inga, I'd like to start with you. So fighting talk and action from the champions in the video just then. Uh, but what, where is the Paris Agreement? We've got talk of carbon neutrality from around 130 countries now. And still the science is saying that we're heading for a three degree world. So is there room for hope from the Paris Agreement or is it a load of hot air? Oh, no, it's not a load of hot air. It's absolutely essential that we meet its goals. Anything else would be impossible to contemplate. But look, let's look at it this way. If we just do what we promised in what is called the nationally determined contribution, these promissory notes that each country has submitted, well, yeah, then yes, we will, uh, by the end of 2100, reach uh, three degrees or 3.5. Uh, but uh, with the net zero commitments that have come in, uh, well, we're beginning to shave off a little bit. We have 51% of all emissions have come in and made this net zero, that they will reach net zero com emissions by 20, uh, 2050. That should get us to around 2.6 degrees. We're still not there, but um, then we uh, would like to see, obviously, the others come in. Plus, right now, we are literally pumping trillions of dollars into our economy to re restart post-pandemic. So the question before us is, do we want to push that public money, which we are borrowing from the future, make no mistake, into a broken planet? Or do we want to use this to restart with a cleaner, greener uh, planet? And that's why we will not again, I hope, have so much public money going into, into the private sector, into businesses, which is a good thing. We want to restart our economy. 
let's make some green strings attached. Let's make sure that this goes to and with uh, conditions on uh, companies um, that can can reduce their emissions. And let's go for renewable energy and all of these infrastructure investments that are being approved across parliaments across the world. So we can get there. And actually, with the stimulus packages being approved right now, we have an opportunity to make it. Our, our calculations, my last point, show us that if we use what we project in terms of stimulus packages still to come, if we use this in climate positive ways, we can hit two degrees and we're within a fighting chance of 1.5. Mindy, where do you stand on this? Are you as hopeful? And, and you were there at the Paris Agreement, weren't you? You helped to catalyse the necessary business support to, to get the Paris Agreement across the finishing line. So, so thinking back to five years ago, are you hopeful that we could turn this around? I'm not only hopeful, and I am, and I'll talk about why that's the case, uh, but it has to be the way we think about our future. Somehow issues like climate change have become things that some people support, others don't. They've become political. What we're talking about here is our children's future. Every person I know who has a child, a niece, a nephew, certainly I have two children, they're grown now, we would throw ourselves in front of a bus if it were coming at our children. That, that's what we do. Uh, and it didn't, wouldn't matter what political background we have or what country we're from. Right now, we're looking at a challenge and a threat that is like that bus coming at our children. And we've got to bring come together all countries, all parts of the world, and all pro political persuasions to stop that bus. Um, but I think we can, and I think we can for the following reasons. One is the Paris Agreement is strong, is powerful, and when the United States back in, and we are back in, that's the good news, uh, with the change of administration, we will have the entire world focused on a shared and a joint goal. And I think we can meet it. The other reasons I'm optimistic is I've spent the last five years while the United States did back out at, at, over the last three and a half years, uh, working to move capital markets, leading businesses, leading investors. They now understand, uh, and they've been at it for a long time as well, that this is a problem that affects our economy as well as, of course, our humanity, our children, our families. And they're acting. So it is not people just waiting for government. It's hundreds and hundreds of companies saying, we will get to net zero by 2050, if not earlier. And we're now expecting that to be 2040. And now the investor community, people are making commitments as recently as this week that they too will get to net zero. So I think we have to be hopeful. I am hopeful based on what I'm seeing, uh, but it will not be easy. We've got to move at a pace and a scale that's entirely different than what we've seen before. Moving slowly is the same as not doing anything. Climate is a big enough problem that we've got to keep moving it quickly. The less we act now, the further the problem grows. Uh, so it is time to act. And I'm delighted that the U.S. is back in. And of course, the planet's not going to respond to pledges and promises. Dr. Fabian, what's your view of the situation as a scientist? Well, obviously, things are interconnected, right? So we have the climate, which impacts the environment and people directly and animals. So if you have an intact environment, you obviously also have a much better chance to reduce the risk of disease transmission from different kinds of animals to humans to keep them at the places where they belong. So there are all these interconnections, right? By cutting the forest, you also ex again affect the climate and that again affects the disease risks. So we have to recognize that there is not one problem. There are several problems to tackle at the same time. So we have the environment, the human health and the animal health closely interconnected. And this is actually nice because we can make use of the different approaches to reach the same goal. So this is what we call the One Health approach. And this is what we are fighting for. And Inge, can you tell us a bit more about what, it, what is the One Health approach? 
So what we're really looking for, and, and this is part of the important work and why we are, why we are making this award um, at this time uh, to, to uh, Dr. Fabian Lenders, is to understand that if you like planetary health, nature's health, um, is connected to veterinary health, animal health is connected to human health, yours and my health. And often we have not really understood, we build our hospitals, we have our ministries of health, what have you, and we go to the doctor and we consider that that is completely separate from how is the planet doing. But the thing here is that we need to understand that we are seeing these zoonoses, these diseases that emerge in nature, is uh, often transmitted through wild animals and then perhaps to a domesticated or illegally traded animal, uh, what have you, onto humans. We are not really fully understanding that that, that is an, uh, the incidence of zoonosis has increased tremendously and that as we illegally trade more and more as we fragment and destroy uh, natural ecosystems and, and fragment them, well, then these ecosystems get under stress. So the one health means that we need to understand that we have to work together on the planetary dimensions, making sure our, our ecosystems are healthy, if you like, animal dimensions, making sure both uh, domesticated and wild animals are healthy and understanding their diseases, which is, of course, where Dr. Lenders has been doing uh, phenomenal work and ensuring that we, our human health is taken care of. We have recently, at United Nations Environment Program, signed a, uh, an MOU uh, with our friends in WHO, the World Health Organization, our friends in FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the organization OIE that deals with uh, animal health. This is critical, and it's not new, unfortunately. Uh, this has been on the agenda for many years, but countries um, haven't quite understood it because it seems so far-fetched. But what do I have to do? What does my health have to do with that of an ecosystem? But in fact, as we heard from Dr. Lenders, everything is connected to everything. And it is important that we begin to understand those interconnects and deal with them as such. And Mindy, what are you seeing from the business community? Because if, um, the, if the, an, there is an understanding that everything is so interconnected, but, but still, I mean, in the post-pandemic stimulus funds, um, governments are still putting 50% more money towards fossil fuels rather than to renewable energy. How can, how can we explain that? Well, it's a good question. And, you know, responding to my colleagues and to your question, if there was one thing we learned from COVID, it is one, we're a world community, and two, it has shaken our system, a system of human health. We are seeing deaths unlike anything we'd ever want to imagine. And it has shaken our economy. And I hope we are smart enough as a world community to learn from that. That one set of circumstances, and of course it's not one, but the start was one, uh, that COVID has rocked our economic, our personal, our humane our planetary ecosystem in ways that we never could have imagined. And we're all suffering. It doesn't really matter if we're in Venezuela or Brazil or China or the U.S. We are all suffering mightily, both at an economic and a fundamental human level. The reality is climate will be worse, and it's already starting to be. The shake to our system in terms of our economy, our health, uh, our humanity, uh, will be far worse. So the need to understand what we're living in during COVID, and we are all living that together, and to what climate will bring upon us is really crucial. We know we should have acted earlier on COVID, um, and we know we have to act now sooner rather than later at extraordinarily increased efforts um, to deal with climate change. And I think the key is we are all understanding that. There are people could agree, disagree with the science, but overall, our opinion leaders, our public, our students, our young people who are in the streets calling for change and demanding more from all of us. Businesses are seeing the impact on their economy. Think about if you're an insurance company and you've paid out billions and billions of dollars this year alone from storm damage, from wildfires. Um, climate is upon us, and thought leaders understand that and are starting to act. So it, it is true. We haven't moved all business leaders or all of the public. 
Um, but we need to do that through facts, through science, and also through fear. We're all fearful of what might come next. And so can we move the stimulus package? And I couldn't agree more. That is and should be a key focus for all of us. We will likely see somewhere between five and ten trillion dollars, that's trillion with a T, not billions, um, moving into bringing us out of COVID. Some call it Build Back Better, some see it as a stimulus package, some see it as an infrastructure bill, but that's more money being pumped into our economy globally than we have seen in our lifetimes. And it gives us two options. We either stay the course and use it in the way we always have and stay in a fossil fuel economy, which will do us in, or we use this enormously important opportunity to make sure that a good deal of those trillions of dollars go into building our economy in a healthier, safer way, but in a way that's more equitable, that's just. And there are specific examples. It's not just words. There are cement, there are steel, there are products that we could use that are less emitting. Let's not build every new highway, every new bus station, every new hospital with those old products that are hugely emitting. Let's use it with different steel, with different cement. Let's not only build highways to the suburbs, let's build mass transit in our inner cities where people need more transportation options. Let's build out new energy systems that are decentralized where people locally have more say. And let's do job training to make sure that we're ready for the new economy and bring in all folks in the economy, not just the traditional people who have benefited from it. You know, sometimes we talk about an opportunity in the future. I think that opportunity is now this minute and we will focus on that money or it will move past us very quickly. Uh, so when we're given an opportunity of trillions of dollars of new money being invented, literally printed because it's money that didn't exist um, and our treasuries and our respective countries are all doing it, um, let's find a way to be smart, to be capable, to come together and make sure we use this unique and once in a lifetime opportunity to build back better. Inga, in the UNEP's um, recent emissions gap report, your research found that fossil fuel production has to decline 6% per year for the next 10 years, but actually we're on track for an average annual increase of 2%. So as Mindy says, the time is now, but yet the actions of, of countries around the world doesn't reflect now at all. No, I mean, what, first of all, you know, yes, we saw a dip in 2020. We shouldn't attach too much importance to that dip from a carbon perspective. Uh, that's because uh, the solution is obviously not to lock humanity up and have 1.9 billion children out of school. Um, so whilst we saw a dip in 2020 of 7% in terms of our emissions, we are seeing a year-on-year -year increase uh, by around, as you say, 2%. That then leads us to precisely in the wrong direction. So uh, we need to, if we want to have a chance of hitting two degrees, we need to shave off uh, significantly uh, of our, our, our carbon emissions. And if we want 1.5, it's around 7.6%, we said last year, uh, reduction year on year. But here is the thing. With now the net zero commitments, which have come in, and you've seen from Korea, from South Africa, from Japan, from the EU, um, uh, as well as from China, net zero before 2060. And if we assume uh, when Biden, uh, when Biden, the president elect takes office, he said on the first day he will rejoin Paris. And we assume that they will also make a net zero by 2050 commitment. If that, that will take us to uh, 63 percent of all emissions. That begins us to get us somewhere, as I said. If we include the U.S., we would be reducing uh, and hitting uh, 2.6 degrees, more or less. If we then expand that commitment to those uh, G20, especially big, uh, G20 economies, the G20 in emits about 78 percent of all emissions of so just those 10 20 countries nearly 80% of all emissions. So they have a historic as well as a present responsibility. So getting them inside is what we need. But with the net zero commitments, we are seeing something that is happening. Now what we are calling for, and this is what we will be hearing today in the climate summit, is 
we want to see, don't plan this in 2049 because that will be too late. You have to submit, each country has to submit what is called a nationally determined contribution to COP26 that will take place next year in Glasgow, where they detail the plans for how. What are you going to do in 2022? What are you going to do in 2023? And on. And each five years, we want to take stock, that's under the Paris Agreement, and see how we're doing and stretch ambition. That's the only way we can get there. The good news is, if we compare to the NDCs, the National Determined Contributions, that were submitted in Paris five years ago to where we are today, ambition has been stretched. Mm -hmm. So we're beginning to make that headway. With the trillions going into stimulus, now is the time. And as Mindy said so eloquently, we can't borrow. It's our children who will be paying these debts that we are taking now in terms of bonds, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. We can't leave the kids, the next generation, both with a debt as well as with a broken plan. Absolutely, planet. yeah. I mean, what about individuals in general? This is the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. It's also, you know, we're speaking to two champions here. I mean, what is the, we've been talking about government and business, but what is the role of individuals in this? What role can they play in being part of the solution? In the emissions gap report to which you referenced, um, we show that two thirds, two thirds of all emissions are linked to private house households. So when people say, well, it's hopeless, what can I do? No, you can do everything because two thirds of our emissions are linked to private households, to our mobility. So how we move about by air, by sea and by land, including the food that we eat because that's often transported from faraway places with a heavy carbon footprint. And it's linked to our residential, how many square feet or square meters do, does each person need? And it's linked to the food that we eat. But Dr. Fabian, okay. other individual things, sorry, sorry, Inga, but other things that individuals could do to prevent pandemics as well? I totally agree uh, that every individual can do a lot and that is not always linked directly to emerging diseases but to climate to habitat and to what we are using at home what we are eating where the food comes from i mean people are eating much more stuff which coming from other countries now than we used to right so rem mm -hmm. remember the local food we have these kinds of things and and that will impact uh, also health indirectly the other thing is obviously that that you can just buy the normal things like hygiene, how do you store your food and how, how do you do you live basically in your day to day life already also reduce risks here. I mean, the important thing is that we are an enormously large human population. There's no species as dominant as we are. And we are not different populations. We are one big population around the world, right? So if a virus makes the jumps into our population now, it will spread around the world very quickly. So we have to be extremely and even more sensitive to about these issues than we used to be 20 or 100 years ago. So we are really on the rise with our species still. And this is creating from an infectious disease point of view an enormous risk. So this is an additional layer um, to consider when you think about the risk we're taking by changing the environment on how we intrude in the last forest and how we live our environment in general. So yeah, so we're responsible for a lot, aren't we? And therefore, it's, as, as the champions show, it really is within our hands to be able to do something about it. Well, thanks to all our guests, Inga Anderson, Dr. Fabian Lindertz and Mindy Luber. And thank you too for watching this special episode in collaboration with the UN's Environment Programme. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Amanda Burrell, and the whole team, goodbye for now. <laughs>